thank you so much, friends, for a chance to be with you. What a blessing it is to me. Uh, I am working with East West Ministries. Our, our mission statement is multiplying disciples of Jesus in the spiritually darkest places on earth. And so we're involved in 19 countries where typically less than 2% Christians, uh, horrible access, illegal to share Christ, no indigenous witness. It's uh, very spiritually dark places. And these are the places God has called us to be, and these are the places we are very grateful to be. I have a friend named Jerry who lives in the state of Idaho who takes initiative incessantly. I've never known a man who took initiative like Jerry does. We were at an oil change place a few months ago, and I had my son's car. I was getting oil changed for him. And we, we walked in. The place was extremely busy. And the person at the counter said, well, it'll be an hour till I can do your car. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll sit here for an hour and shoot the breeze. And Jerry said, listen, could we just put our name in the list and go do some other errands and come back. And the guy said, sure. We put our name on the list, did a bunch of other things, came back, got our oil changed immediately. Jerry is a person who takes initiative. When he sees something to start, stop, or change, he just does it. Something to start, stop, or change, he just does it. It's a quality I wish I had more in my life. It is a quality that is right in the middle of the character of God. When God sees something to start, stop, or change, He just does it. I want, to, I want to ask you to think today about a man who did the same thing. It's a man named Jonathan. The passage is in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 to 15. Let me give you a little bit of the background. If you want to turn there, I'll be reading that in just a moment. So Israel has demanded a king like the nations around them. God gave them a king in the, in the form of this man named Saul. Saul has a son named Jonathan. And Israel's at war with the Philistines. This is about a little more than a thousand years before Christ. The Philistines lived at that time along the Mediterranean Sea in what would today be the Gaza Strip. They were very warlike people. They made a huge amount of money in shipping. They had lots of resources. They hated the nation of Israel. And so Israel's at war with these people. Frankly, Saul has stirred them up. Saul has made them angry. And they're in a big mess because, number one, Saul offered sacrifice that only the priest was or the prophet was supposed to do, and therefore God was displeased with him. God said, I'm going to remove you. You're not going to be king anymore. They were in a further problem because if you bump back to chapter 13, you will see the Philistines have removed all of their ironsmiths, all of their blacksmiths. Only Saul and, and Jonathan have swords. The rest of them have nothing but axes or hoes or whatever kind of a farming implement. They're, they're at a huge disadvantage. And so Samuel, the prophet, has told Saul, you will not be king anymore because you've offered this sacrifice. That means Jonathan, his son, is not going to be king. It means that their whole situation is a terrific mess. 1 Samuel, chapter 14, verse 1, they're at war with the Philistines. Now the day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah, under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of the Lord at Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. The people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp crag on one side and a sharp crag on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sena. The one crag rose on the north opposite Michmash, and the other on the south opposite Geba. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or few. The armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, turn yourself, and here I am with you according to your desire. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to the men, or reveal ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say to us, Come to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hands, and this shall be a sign for us. 
when both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, Behold, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. Huge amount of disdain in that statement. Basically, uh, calling the Hebrews sort of uh, dogs or gophers or moles who are just hiding in the ground. Behold, they have come out of the holes where they are hiding themselves. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we'll tell you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer behind him, and there fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer put some to death all after him. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about twenty men within about a half a furlough in an acre of land. And there was a trembling in the camp and in the field and among all the people. Even the garrison and the raiders trembled. The earth quaked so that it became a great trembling. I want to talk through this text for just a moment and then come to sort of what I think is the main idea, the big idea main application for us out of this passage. So here's this man, Jonathan. <clears throat> he should have been king. He's not going to be king because of the sin of his father, but he decides I'm going to cross over and attack the Philistines. He is a man of initiative. He needs to start something that is defeating the Philistines. He needs to stop something that is being passive. He needs to change something that is the dominance of the Philistines. And he just says, I'm going to do it. And in contrast to that, look at verse 2, it says, Saul, his father, was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah. I think that's a physical statement about where he was residing, but I think it's also a spiritual statement about passivity. He was staying instead of going. Here's the king who's supposed to be defeating the Philistines. He's staying. And furthermore, he had the ephod with him. That's this uh, shirt that has the 12 stones of the tribes of Israel on it. And somehow you can discern the will of God through this ephod. You ask God a question, apparently he changed the stones, but you can know the will of God through this ephod. He had the resources to ask God what to do and to know what to do, but he was passive. He was just parked there. But Jonathan, his son, verse 4, <clears throat> he's going to go up and attack them. This is, this is a very defensible place where the Philistines are. It's high. There's only one way to get up because there's a crag on each side. You've got to go up this narrow little place. It's very defensible. It's a difficult position to be. But Jonathan says, verse 6, come, let's cross over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. The uncircumcised is more than a physical statement. It is a spiritual statement. These people don't have the sign of the covenant. They're not God's people. They don't have the resource of God to help them. They are, in this word, Jonathan is saying, they're helpless. They're without resources. Why should we be afraid of people without resources? We're in covenant relationship with the God of the universe. Jonathan plus armor bearer plus God is a vast majority. These people have nothing. And Jonathan knows that. He says, perhaps the Lord will work for us. I'm not certain that he wants to work in this situation. It's a perhaps. I'm going to act in trust. Whether he works or not, I'm going to do the right thing. He may work on our behalf, for he is not restrained to save by many or by few. God by nature is not restrained. He's infinite. He has restrained himself by his character. He's restrained that he can't do sin because he's voluntarily chosen to be a, a perfect, uh, perfect holy being. But he's not restrained by anything else. He's not out of resources. He's not out of wisdom. He's not short on time. He's got, he's got no restraints on him. So if he wants to save with 100,000, he could do it. And if he wants to save with the son's king and an armor bearer, he could do it. This is two people. Two people. Friends, uh, Sam mentioned I was in Istanbul last week. Uh, about two weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Istanbul decided to cut down some trees in a park and build a mall in it. Four people went to demonstrate. Four people who were environmentally conscious and who wanted the park to remain went to demonstrate. It grew into 70 cities, tens of thousands of people, and an incredible firestorm across Turkey. Four people. Two people. 
God is not restrained by numbers. You have no idea what God's going to do. He could do something beyond all that you can think or imagine. He's not restrained by numbers. So Jonathan, because he took initiative, verse 7, someone was willing to go with him. His armor bearer said, I'm with you. I'm in. When you and I take initiative, we can bring people to go with us. We can be influencers as Jonathan was. But Jonathan not only had initiative, he said, I'm going to cross over, but I'm going to have a plan. Verse 9. My plan is this. If they say, come up to us, we're going up. If they say, stay down there, we're staying down there. Whatever they say, we're going to do, because that's where we know God's going to be in it. God's going to help us. And so they took this massive risk, verse 11. They revealed themselves to the enemy. Now, one of the key issues, <clears throat> I have a friend who's a policeman down in Houston. One of the key issues when you're in a fight is what they call cover. There's soft cover. That's hiding behind something that could be shot through. And there's hard cover hiding behind something that couldn't be shot through. But if there's anything you don't want, it's uncovered. You want to be at least behind a curtain that it could be shot through, but you're hidden. Or behind a brick wall, which can't be shot through, but you don't want to be uncovered. So Jonathan takes this amazing risk. He and his armor bearer, they just come out in broad daylight and say to their enemy, here we are. As I mentioned in reading the text, they received this huge, huge condemnation this derision. You, here's the Hebrews. They're coming out of the holes where they've been hiding. Look at the dogs and the gophers and the badgers coming out. They, they are such pathetic people and such horrible warriors. And I can't believe they came out of the hole where they were hiding. When they revealed themselves, the Philistines said, come up here. We want to tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> we want to tell you something. Come up here. We want to kill you. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, this is our plan. Hadn't we said ahead of time, if they say come up, we're going up, and God is giving them into our hands, and so they go up. And here's the amazing part, friends. Verse 13. It is so steep, they're having to go hands and feet. I was in Montana doing a men's retreat about a month ago. We climbed up to this one peak. It was so steep that we were going in the rocks, hand and feet. You couldn't walk up like this. You had to use your hands and feet. It was that steep. This is emphasizing the incredible disadvantage he is at because they're climbing up hands and feet with soldiers above them. All one of them would have to do is chuck a big rock on them. This is amazing disadvantage. But they get up there and the text says they slaughtered. They killed 20 of them in less than an acre of land. Jonathan's armor bearer helped as well. God gave them a great victory despite there was two people and despite the fact they had to climb up hands and feet in a very defensible position. And when that happened, verse 15, there was a trembling in the camp and in the field and among all the people and in the garrison and the raiders trembled and the earthquake so that it became a great trembling. Now friends, when God works, things shake. Here's the crazy part about this translation. The phrase, a great trembling, at the very end of that verse, literally means a trembling of God, a trembling caused by God. I have no idea why they translated this a great, a great trembling. It should say a trembling of God. And when God works, things shake. People take notice. God's glory is enhanced. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. So let me suggest this core idea. We must act even against great odds in the hope that God will act for us, even though there is danger, even though there are no guarantees, and when God works, there's a great trembling. Let me talk about those each for just a moment. We need to act. We need to take initiative. We need to look at the life around us and say, what needs to be started, stopped, or changed? Would I be willing to be like God? Would I be willing to be like his servant, Jonathan? Would I be willing to take initiative where things in my life and things around me need to be Secondly, would I be willing to act against the odds? The Philippians, or the Philistines, had this high place. Paul and his armor bearer, there's two of them, there's at least 20 of them. They're up above them, they're climbing up hands and feet. And the question is never, is it hard? The question is never, will it work? The question is always, is it right? Is this something I should do? And Jonathan said it was right. 
and against the odds I will do it. He acted in hope. He was saying perhaps he had no guarantees, and I'm convinced that God calls us to act on things for which we have no guarantees. We walk by faith and not by sight. I don't know how many times God in my life has brought me to a place where I had to act in a way which was not guaranteed. And when you've had to do that, you know the anxiety of it, you know the struggle of your heart to cast yourself on God and not be a person of anxiety. Perhaps God will work. He was willing to take a risk as we are willing to take risks for him as well. Perhaps God will act for us. 2 Corinthians 3.5 says this, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. <clears throat> Here's Dave Gibson's personal resources. Let me list them for you. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> There's none. I have no personal resources, power, ability. I have nothing in me that can, can guarantee success or impact. But our resource, your resource, when you've trusted Christ, the resource of Jonathan and the armor bearer was the entire adequacy of God. Myself, I have nothing, and God, I have a finite ability to do the things he sets before me. One of the beautiful things about God is he never asks us to do things for which he does not have resources. He does not mock us. My kids were little, we lived in a trailer house in Alaska, and I used to take them and put them on my hands and hold them up against the ceiling of the trailer. And then I would say to them, get down, get down right now. I would mock them. What a horrible father I am, right here in Father's Day month. Forgive me. They couldn't get down unless I would let them down. God is a far better father than me because he doesn't give us stuff to do for which he does not resource us. God is the adequate being. He may work for us. He built the wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. He helped a Chinese farmer in China, in northwest China, to plant thousands of churches. He works in our hearts and our lives. He works for us, even though there is danger. Friends, let me just tell you what you already know. This is war. I'm sorry. You're in spiritual war. The world hates you. The flesh is ready to mutiny against you, and Satan wants to destroy you. It's war. We have no choice. I heard one of our politicians say recently, we must end the war on terrorism just as every war must end. And I'm hearing that and thinking to myself, you can't end a war if the enemy won't stop. Or if the enemy won't be subdued. You can't just quit. It's not your choice. We can't just quit. The world, the flesh, and the devil are not going to lay down their weapons until Jesus comes back. We have no choice. We are people at war. We are people in danger. Even when there's no guarantees, you can take an initiative and it wouldn't work. You still need to act. And finally, when God works, there is a trembling. God's presence is known. The earth shakes. People know his glory. People know his greatness. I don't know if you've thought about this, friends, but God is a being who causes things to shake. And he goes into rooms and they fill up with smoke. He goes to Mount Sinai and it shakes. He speaks to the people of Israel and they say, don't talk to us. Talk to Moses. He can talk to us. I, I, I'm too afraid to hear the voice of God. That's the kind of being he is. I hear people say to me, when I see God, I'm going to go straight up to him and say, why did my brother die so young? I feel very bad if someone's brother died young. I feel very bad for this man, 26 year old. What a, what a sadness. But when we see God, nobody rushes up to him and demands answers. Everyone gets on their face. That's the kind of being he is. You ever walk down the street and just had the urge to get on your face in front of someone? <laughs> I've never had it. I've had the urge to punch people. I've had the urge to laugh at people. I've had the urge to do a lot of things for people, but never get on my face. It's the kind of being God is. He makes things shake. That's the kind of power he has. In myself, my resources are zero. In my God, my resources are infinite. There's a pastor named Mark Hudson. He's at North Coast Community Church in San Diego. He suggested this based on that passage, how to win a battle. Number one, start your own skirmish. Start a fight. 
Ask yourself the question, what should I do something about? What a great question. What should I personally do something about? Number two, he says, lead the way up and line someone to go up with you. When you're leading and drawing people to go up with you, you have a greater impact. Number three, ask these questions. Can I make a difference? Is it aligned with God's heart? Am I moving toward the problem? Friends, I don't know how you do with this, but my own heart is to move away from problems. I still want them. I don't want to mess with problems. I don't, I don't like conflict. I don't want to be in the middle of junk. I don't want to experience unpleasant stuff and sadness and unhappiness and hammering and discouragement and hurt and pain and ugliness. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear any name calling. And I don't want to do any name calling. I don't want to move toward any problems. Jonathan moved toward a problem. And then finally, be the change that you want to see. I want to read you a list of possible sort of well-defended high places. I may hit one or two in your life. I may not hit any. But as I'm reading this list, please ask yourself the question, do I have a well-defended high place in my life that I've just not been willing to address? I've not been willing to take initiative in. I've, been, I've not been willing to act even though it might not succeed. <clears throat> I may hit something in your life. I may not. Ask yourself the question, is there some place in my life where I need to start, stop, or change something that I've been unwilling to take initiative on? Perhaps becoming a spiritual leader in your family, overcoming pornography, renewing your marriage relationship, gaining physical fitness, stop cheating in school, building an incredible diligence in your work life, getting into God's Word in a consistent and serious way, repairing a broken relationship, applying yourself at school, making right something that you did and you regret, asking for help on an addiction, becoming faithful in the pursuit of God, being a faithful person and sharing Christ in missional living, going out for the basketball team, trying out for the play, going public with Jesus at work, becoming faithful in your finances, giving, saving, dealing with debt, generosity, getting rid of something in your life that's causing you to stumble, organizing some place of physical chaos, applying for college, opening your heart to the possibility of full-time ministry, is there some well-defended high place in your life about which God is saying, I need to act? I don't have guarantee of victory. Who knows what God would do? He might do something, he might not. The question is never, is it guaranteed? The question is never, is it easy? The question is always, is it right? What would I be willing to do to take initiative in something that God will lay on my heart? Friends, we talked about initiative in my friend Jerry, talked about initiative in Jonathan, talked about passivity in Saul, talked about our need to take initiative. I'm going to close our service today to think about an incredible initiative that God took for us. He saw us helpless and hopeless, sin covering our lives, no way to guarantee, no way to deal with the sin in our lives, completely separated from God, people utterly without resources. People who were not as bad as we could be, we could have been worse in terms of our behavior. But we were as bad off as we could be. It could not have been worse for us. And in that condition, Jesus comes down, steps down, becomes a human, steps down to death, steps down to this most brutal death on the cross, hangs on the cross and pays for our sin in our place. Friends, I was standing in a long line of people waiting to go up on the cross and be punished for my sin. And when I got to the front of that line of about 10 billion people, Jesus said to me, stand over here, Dave, I'm going to go up and pay in your place. And having paid in my place, he offered me forgiveness through his death and said, Dave, if you put your trust in me, I'll forgive you. You won't have to pay for the evil things you've done. Today we're celebrating that gift, we're celebrating that initiative, we're celebrating especially the Lord Jesus Christ and as he commanded us, as often as you do this, whether it's every day, every week, every month, once a year, as often as you do this, remember me. And that's dovetailed perfectly with Paul's command that says, and when you do this, examine yourself. Open your heart before God. Hebrews says, everything is open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is nothing that God doesn't know. And so we open our lives 
we examine ourselves, we confess our sin, and we say, I want to come to this table, Father, with a pure heart. So we're, we have the elements here. Uh, please come and take them when you're ready. Bring them back to your chair and hold them. And Pastor Sam will come up and lead us to take them together at the end. Our Father, we bless you today for the initiative of Jonathan. We bless you today for the initiative uh, that you took in sending your son. For the initiative he took to do your will, to pay for our sin. We are deeply grateful to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We're deeply grateful at this moment to reflect on his love, to reflect on his sacrifice. We take time now in our hearts, Father, to open ourselves to you. Pray your spirit to lead us to understand our sin, to confess it openly and humbly, to experience your cleansing. We love you, Father. We thank you for the death of Christ. We praise you in Jesus' name.